So all these categories and their subdivisions, um, it isn't just to have some nice, neat system, but um, rather it it's to help us help us know the diversity of things that exist and to look at some of their common qualities and their differences um, so that we can really uh, understand them deeply, their impermanence in terms of the, um, uh, the condition phenomena, uh, their nature of being unsatisfactory or dukkha, you know, for the things that are under the control of afflictions and karma, and their nature of being selfless or empty, yeah, simply because they exist. And uh, in order to exist, something has to be empty, and something has to also be dependently arising. Yeah, you can't have one without the other. So uh, maybe you see some similarity here between this and the uh, the four uh, seals, yeah, and the four truths, and the way phenomena are laid out. And so you begin to see some patterns here, and uh, it points you in different directions in terms of understanding things, yeah? Because usually our ignorant understanding is like, Oh, look, this tablecloth is gorgeous. Look, it's so beautiful. It's so smooth. It has these patterns. If I put this on my table, everybody's going to look at it and go, Wow, she has the most beautiful tablecloth. And then my reputation will go up. Okay, so I'm using a stupid example. But look in your own life. For examples that you think are very important, which are actually just as stupid. <laughs> yeah? You know, I will deliver this incredible paper that nobody has ever thought of these ideas before, and it will open the whole field I'm in and cause a revitalization, and everybody will say how brilliant I am, and then I'll get invitations to go places and speak, and I'll make a lot of money, and people will know my name, and my name will precede me. And isn't that wonderful? Then I'm really successful. And because I'm successful, I will have a lot more friends. And I will have a lot more lovers. And I will have a lot more this and that and everything. Yeah? So aren't I fantastic? Because I wrote this fantastic, earth-shattering, groundbreaking paper on... Artificial intelligence, <laughs> which actually I had my robo, right? <laughs> or I wrote this fantastic law brief that, you know, shattered Trump once and for all and he can't do anything. Or I wrote this medical paper that, you know, opens the field up so that people can find, you know, the source of all disease, uh, you know? And we think we're really fantastic. And isn't that, you know, to boost our ego, as important as having a beautiful green tablecloth? <laughs> you know, if you look at the motivation behind it, okay, you know, okay, maybe you know, certain things themselves, the action can be of more benefit to more people. But if you look at the motivation behind the action, which is what principally determines whether the action is virtuous or non-virtuous, yeah, the motivation is the same for having a green, a beautiful green tablecloth. <laughs> yeah? Okay, so if you haven't been confused before, let's do the 12 sources and 18 constituents. 
Okay, so an alternative method of classifying all phenomena. So the five aggregates were just for impermanent phenomena. The 12 sources and 18 constituents are for all phenomena, including the permanent ones, too. Okay, so here you can classify them into the 12 sources, which they're so-called because they are the sources that give rise to consciousness. So six of them are external, the objects known by consciousness, and six are internal, the cognitive faculties that we were talking about this morning, the subtle material in the gross physical organs. Okay, So the cognitive faculties of a person that enable an object to be cognized by a consciousness. So here's the chart with the 12 sources. Yeah, so I didn't make an, an outline for the, the previous stuff. Did you make outlines? Was that helpful? Yeah, that's good. So, you know, remember that. Okay, so you have your internal source and your external source. And they're, it's pretty understandable, isn't it? You know, your eye source or your eye faculty sees forms and your ear source hears sounds. The one that is more difficult is the mental source that knows phenomena. Okay? So let's read a little bit here. The eye source, ear source, and so forth are called internal sources. Um, sometimes it's, they're called the eye faculty or the eye sense uh, power. There's different words that are used. Uh, okay. So they're called the internal sources because they belong to the person. The first five, the eye, ear, nose, tongue, and tactile sources, are not the gross organs such as the eyeball and the ear. They are subtle forms within the gross organ that are sensitive and receptive to their corresponding object. The mental source, okay, this is the one that's more difficult to understand, includes all six consciousnesses, Okay, so the, what, the first five, there were physical things that were the source. For the mental consciousness, the source is all six consciousnesses. So it's not a physical faculty. Yeah, it's all six consciousnesses because they have the power to give rise to a mental consciousness that knows a phenomenon. For example, dependent on the visual consciousness seeing blue, the mental consciousness remembers blue. Uh, you know, in some cases, there's a direct mental perceiver, such as um, the superknowledges, you know, clairvoyance, clairaudience, uh, seeing past and future lives, seeing, uh, knowing others' minds, these kind of powers, they're direct mental consciousnesses. Um, but what about conceptual consciousnesses? Yeah, when we remember what blue looks like, that's a conceptual consciousness. Okay. So how you know how do these things work? Yeah, and then uh, you begin to see how, uh, in the case of the you know the physical organ, the physical consciousnesses, how they become the source or the faculty that makes a mental consciousness operate, whether it's a mental direct perceiver or most often for common beings, um, uh, a conceptual mind. Okay, And it's very interesting to watch this in your experience, you know, and notice how you see something and then later how you remember it. Yeah, and what, what is it that enables that memory to happen? You know, what is the faculty that sparks that memory in you of what that object was? And note how, you know, the object that's appearing to your mind is basically a conceptual appearance. And the object that you're apprehending or trying to understand is the actual object. When you remember blue, what's appearing to your mind is the conceptual appearance of blue. The object you're trying to understand is blue. Okay. Then the 18 constituents, um, which consist of objects and their corresponding mental faculties and consciousness. Consciousnesses see uh, 
another are another way to categorize all phenomena, both permanent and impermanent. Before we go on to them, the 12 sources, do you think they, they really encompass all phenomena? Yeah, what, what, uh, well, first of all, where are the consciousnesses? The consciousnesses are phenomena, and you don't see any of them listed outright in the 12 sources. Yeah, so the, all the consciousnesses go under mental source. Then what kind of consciousness knows permanent phenomena? Does your eye, uh, your visual consciousness know it? It's your mental consciousness. Okay, so it's the one that knows permanent phenomena. So even though consciousnesses aren't specifically visible in the chart, nor are permanent phenomena, yeah, uh, they are, well, the permanent phenomena are under the phenomena external source, and the consciousnesses are in the internal source, uh, the mental source. Okay, The 18 constituents just breaks this out more obviously. There's a chart on the next page, so we'll keep reading, and then you can look at the chart. Okay, the phenomena source and the phenomena constituent include only objects known uniquely by the mental consciousness. Permanent phenomena such as emptiness and permanent space, okay, and some, uh, some impermanent phenomena <clears throat> such as feelings and the forms for mental consciousness. So not all phenomena are put in the uh, the phenomena source or the phenomena um, uh, observed object. Okay, the latter, the latter meaning forms for mental consciousness. Yeah, appears sing, uh, consists of single particles because our eyes cannot see single particles. We can't see atoms. We can't see molecules. We can only see collections of them. So it requires a mental consciousness with some special abilities to be able to see um, uh, molecules. You know, that can't be done with our eye consciousness. Yeah, it's only the mental consciousness that can, that can know them. Yeah, so... Uh, if you have special powers, then you can see those directly. If you don't, then uh, you know the existence of atoms and molecules through inference. Yeah. So that's basically how science knows the existence of atoms and molecules. Yeah. I mean, I think even no matter how strong um, microscopes are, you can't. There's really? There's a kind of scope that can see atoms? It's so large that they, they, they built it so large and it's underground and I think they needed it to generate the speed that was necessary. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that it does enable them to then see atoms. Actually. See with their eye? Or are they only seeing like the energy trace that the atom exists leaves behind and they impute atom on that? It's, I think it's that. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so the latter, the objects of mental consciousness, consist of single particles. The appearance of clear space to the mental consciousness, imperceptible forms, such as our precepts, dream objects, okay, so that, you know, golden mountain you climbed in your dream and the monster who chased you there are, are uh, all dream objects. And forms uh, generated uh, in deep concentration. These forms are quite interesting. When you there's one meditation that we uh, do on uh, bones, for example, and it's to subdue attachment. And you start by um, thinking that all the flesh 
uh, ar- around your bones completely dissolves. You slowly watch it dissolve until there's just a skeleton there. And then you imagine the skeleton getting bigger and bigger and multiplying until the whole universe is filled with bones. Nothing else, just bones. And the, med- the meditation is very effective for calming attachment to sense objects, okay, especially uh, attachment to the body or, or to any kind of beautiful object. At the end of the, it's very interesting. When you do it, the whole u- universe filled with bones. That, that one's okay. That doesn't give you such an, a yuck feeling. It's when the second half of the meditation, when the bones condense down to your skeleton and you think of all the flesh and tissues re- reappearing, that's when it really hits you. Or at least for me, you know, pure white bones, okay, that's okay. But then all this other stuff appearing that, you know, hangs on the bones. Anyway, meditators who have deep samadhi, you know, when we're doing that meditation, it's all conceptual consciousness, okay? So it's, it's conceptual appearances that are appearing to the mind. But people who have very deep samadhi, their objects become um, these phenomena sources, forms generated in deep concentration. So the bones they're seeing are the bones, they're, they're a type of form that's only perceivable to mental consciousness. I mean, that's how um, refined their samadhi is, is that what they visualize actually becomes some kind of form. I don't know if other people can see those forms or only that meditator. I suspect it's only that meditator, although in the case of the Buddha, I wouldn't be surprised if he could show other people these kinds of things because he did that kind of stuff when he was alive. Okay? But it's interesting to think about, you know, that you can just visualize something so much and then it becomes something. And I think that's very much what happens when people have actual uh, visions of deities. Yeah. Not just, you know, your, your you know, excited experience of seeing a deity, but actual uh, visions of deities that you've focused so much with samadhi that the, you know, the deity appears there. Okay. When we think deeply about these diverse ways of classifying phenomena, we begin to see that the self we consider to be one unique item is actually a collection of diverse factors that function dependent on one another. So here you have, with these two charts, the 12 sources, the 18 constituents, all phenomena. Okay, now, where is the person going to go? (laughs) And where... uh, how do you know the person exists? Okay. Because when you start looking for what the person is, you go through all 18 things or all 12 things, and are any of them the person? Yeah. So this is good medicine meal and breakfast conversation, okay? Really look, you know, and look at this. And it's like, okay, where do I belong in this? I have all these faculties. I have all these consciousnesses. The observed objects, I have a form. I make sounds. I produce odors. I guess you could taste, you know, you can touch me, a tangible object, phenomena, but are any of these things me? Where am I among these? Okay. 
So in your own experience, identify each of the 12 sources. Observe the relationship between the internal source, the external source, and the consciousness arisen from them for each sense. So if you'll see the difference between the 12 and the 18 is they both, well, the sameness is they both contain all, all phenomena. The difference is that in the 12, all the mental consciousnesses are included in the mental faculty. In the 18, the conscience, each consciousness has its own little uh, col- you know, its own little cell in the, in the column of apprehending consciousnesses. Okay. Of the six senses, which one prompts strong attachment in you? Which are the source of the greatest anger or aversion? So spend some time with that. Okay. You know, what, what gets, makes my attachment or my anger arise more? Yeah, forms, sounds, odors, tastes, tangibles, phenomena, you know. And then identify the 18 constituents, especially the ones that compose you as a person. And then look for who you are among those 18. Okay. I, and then four, what is the relationship between you, the person, and the constituents that compose you? What's the relationship? Are you one and the same as any of those constituents? Are you completely separate from them? Do you depend on them? Okay. So there's a lot to investigate with this. Yeah. It looks at first just like this chart. Yeah. And then you start asking questions. You see? Okay, so I'll leave you with the questions, and we'll go on to the next session. Section. So consciousness, mind, and mental factors. Okay, so here again, we're looking more closely at uh, some of those divisions that we um, briefly introduced at the beginning of the chapter. There are many ways uh, to speak about and classify types of consciousness. Mind and mental factors is one way. Conceptual and non-conceptual consciousnesses is another way. The seven types of awareness is another way, and so forth. Okay, The Abhidharma makes the division of consciousness into mind and mental factors and describes the components of these categories. Later Indian sages, such as Asanga and Vasubandhu, elaborated on these descriptions in their Compendium of Knowledge, um, which is, was written by Asanga, and Treasury of Knowledge, which was written by Vasubandhu. Okay. When referred to together, these two texts are ta- called the two knowledges. Knowledges is... <laughs> okay. So learning about mind and mental factors enables us to better understand our mind. We will be able to identify in our own experience the mental factors that arise due to pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral feelings, and that in turn create the cause of happiness and suffering by motivating the actions or karma that we do. Okay? So... You remember those of you who have studied the 12 links of dependent origination that uh, after the link of um, con- you, you have six sense sources, you have contact, then you have feeling, and feeling produces craving, which produces clinging, and then rebirth, okay? So there's this link between feeling and craving. So... And this, this is really why feeling is separated out as its own aggregate, because our pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral feelings 
um, our reactions to these run our, our lives, you know? Pleasant feeling, immediately we want more. And we don't want to be separated from it. Unpleasant feeling, immediately we can't stand it. We've got to get rid of it. Neutral feeling, we space out. Okay? So it's very interesting in your life to watch. You know, like we've been watching our mind this week and the different kinds of um, mental factors that arise. And, you know, when you have attachment or anger or jealousy or whatever it is. But then look at the feeling that was happening in your mind before you had that emotion arise. Yeah. Now really look at what that feeling was. Of course, it's easy to understand intellectually. Oh, yeah, pleasant feeling, I get attached. Unpleasant feeling, I get angry. But how aware are we in our own experience of the feeling when it's happening and how out of that feeling comes attachment or aversion? Yeah? Usually we focus more on the object than on our internal experience. The experience, the feeling, is actually what's running the whole thing. But we think it's the object. Yeah? I'm with somebody who praises me and tells me I'm wonderful and this and that, and they love me forever, and they've never met anybody as talented and beautiful and blah, blah as me. And I think, and so I feel happy. And I think that person is making me happy. And of course, I get attached to them. I love them for doing that. So a person who says beautiful things about me, and we go immediately to love. Actually, there's a whole bunch between those two things. Yeah, because we think, I love that person. Okay. First of all, it's not necessarily love. Let's back up here. It's more likely to be attachment. Second of all, you know, that person, what they're saying to me, yeah, is sound. Sound. Yeah, you know, airwaves? <laughs> airwaves? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So all that, I love you, I'm never going to leave you, you're so wonderful, I've never met anybody like you. <laughs> That's all it is, is airwaves. Okay? That's the, the form, the external form. From that, you know, now the sound enters here, we attribute meaning to it, and then feel, you know, after the meaning comes, the meaning is, well, I must be wonderful. And not only am I wonderful, but this person is always going to think I'm wonderful. And that means I have life insurance. <laughs> yeah, I have the life insurance of being wonderful for my whole life. And I feel that feeling of happiness comes inside. Yeah, that feeling of happiness is nice. We want more, we want better. We get attached, then we call it love. But in this whole thing, we just go from that wonderful person to love. We don't realize that all the stuff we're getting is basically sound waves that we're interpreting, that then there's a feeling that arises. And I think that person caused this feeling as if that person has happiness inside them. Because every time I'm near them, then they say this, and I feel happy. 
So it seems like the happiness is coming right out of their mouth into my ears. <laughs> you know? Like that person has happiness inside them. So I want to be near them. Just as when you eat chocolate chip mint ice cream or whatever kind you like, it seems that like there's happiness inside the chocolate chip mints. Okay? When you hear music you like, it seems as if the happiness is inside the music. There's no happiness in any of these external things. They're just inanimate objects. Yeah? But, you know, we get some kind of pleasant feeling on the level of senses, you know, like the voice is pleasant and all of this stuff, and they smell good and they look nice. But then... Our mental consciousness comes in, you know, and it's like, oh, they are wonderful, and because they said this, I must be good. This is how my self-esteem comes about, because these people tell me I'm wonderful. If they tell me, if somebody I love tells me I want, I'm wonderful, I must be wonderful. Yeah, that's a great syllogism, isn't it? I am wonderful because somebody that I love tells me I'm wonderful. Well, why do I love them? It's because they tell me I'm wonderful. If they didn't tell me I was wonderful, I definitely wouldn't want love them. Forget it. You know. So, we, you know, there's all this whole process coming along. And we just go from the object makes me feel good I am loved forever. I never have to consider anything. You know, it's a done deal. Now I can di dish, uh, dish out all my negativity on them because they love me. Because who do we talk worse to in the universe? The people we love. <laughs> okay, you love me? Now I can swear. I can say anything I want. I can criticize you. I can explode. But you love me, so you're trapped until, of course, they resign from the position. <laughs> okay? But then, you know, and then we get attached. It's very interesting to watch this whole mechanism. And we're such suckers. Aren't we? We just fall for everything. Yeah, what's the definition of a friend? Somebody who likes me. <laughs> Somebody who tells me I'm wonderful. Somebody who gives me security. What kind of security do other beings in cyclic existence give us when they're changing every moment under the force of afflictions and karma? Okay, so this is the kind of analysis we have to do, you know, of our life experience. You know, what, what's going on that we feel the way we do, have the emotions we do, think and expect and so on, everything the way we do? Okay. We will be able to identify in our own experience the mental factors that arise due to pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral feelings. So why is a lot of clinging and attachment and longing, you know, that ache of longing for something? I long, I want this, I need this. Where's that coming from? Yeah, it appears... You know, it comes in our mind, and it's such a real feeling, and we need something so badly. But where did that feeling come from? And what am I really expecting is going to satisfy it, you know? And then, of course, what actions do I do to try and get the external object to do what I want it to do so that I have the feelings that are making me feel secure and making me feel like I exist. 
Yeah. That's the, the big thing because ignorance is, um, you know, focuses, thinks we exist in a way that we don't. And we're always trying to prove to ourselves that we actually exist that way. <laughs> you know? And we can't because it's false. Okay, and so, and then, you know, from all that, then it motivates actions. The actions, you know, leave the karmic seeds on our mind. The karmic seeds ripen in terms of our experience. While those karmic seeds are ripening, we're having more perceptions. We're looking at more stuff, having more feelings, generating more afflictions, creating more karma with more karmic seeds in the mind that ripen in terms of our experience. And during that experience, then we have more expectation from external objects, feel, you know, uh, happy, unhappy, or neutral feelings generate more afflictions. And samsara continues. It's sad when you think about it, you know. It, it really, this is where we see why we need to create a lot of merit. Because it takes a lot of courage to look at this stuff. Yeah, it really takes a lot of courage and a clear mind to look at it. And I think it's the creation of merit that kind of buoys the mind and makes it um, receptive and able to look at, at things uh, in this way, yeah? Such introspective awareness of our own mental processes is essential in order to tame and transform our mind. We will also understand that Dharma practice entails subduing the destructive mental factors that lead to misery in cyclic existence and enhancing the constructive ones that lead to happiness in cyclic existence as well as to liberation and awakening. This, in turn, will positively affect our thoughts, words, and deeds. Okay, so the more we can understand this mechanism, yeah, of what causes happiness, what causes suffering, then that will affect you know, how we look at the world, what we think, what we say, what we do, you know? The core of meditation on emptiness is examining how the I or self exists. It appears to be very real and solid. Not solid physically, but real and solid, okay? But can it be found in the aggregates individually or in their collection or separate from the aggregates? It is not too difficult to understand that we are not the body, but the self strongly appears to be associated with the mind. Doesn't it? Yeah. Understanding the various types of mind and how they function will aid us in understanding what the I is and is not, and its relationship to the aggregates. So as we really look very closely at each primary mind, each mental factor, and we say, you know, is this the person? Or is the person a collection of all of these? You know, what am I? Or am I the one who owns these things, in which case I'm separate from them, but I, by, I own these, the body and the, the mental factors and the primary consciousness, you know? Is there a separate I somewhere that is the owner? Or am I one of those things? You know, what's going on here? Exactly who am I or what am I? Yeah. Because we have a whole uh, notion of who we are and our, our role in the world. And we never really examine who that I is. We just take it for granted. 
you know. Don't you think? There's me who's the center of the universe. Isn't that the basic thing we take for granted? There's a real person here whose happiness and unhappiness is more important than anybody else's. <coughs> yeah, we're with friends. We can admit it. <laughs> yeah, we all have this. As noted above, all cognizers consist of primary consciousness and various mental factors that accompany it. Primary consciousnesses are of six types, as mentioned above, visual, auditory, olfactory, gustatory, tactile, and mental primary consciousnesses. Each of these apprehends the fundamental presence of its object. Although a primary consciousness and its accompanying mental factors are different, when they arise together as one mental state, they are the same nature. They are concomitant, which means that they accompany, they come together. Yeah, they're associated. They're concomitant and share five similarities. So what we're, we're going to talk about the five similarities in a minute. But the main point is that while we describe the primary consciousnesses and the mental factors as being separate factors, okay, when it comes to actually perceiving them, it's di you can't cut them apart. Okay? With a physical object, you know, if you have pieces of a puzzle, you put them all together, you have a whole thing, okay? And you can take them all apart and see each individual piece and hold it up separately. But with the primary consciousnesses and the mental factors, you can't do that because you can't have a primary consciousness without there being some mental factors there. And you can't have a mental factor alone without it being part of a primary, you know, conjoined with a primary consciousness. So while we talk about these things as individual items, in fact, we can't cut them apart and put them in separate little boxes to notice them. Okay? So why can't we? Because they have these five similarities. So, the fir they, first of all, they have the fa for same basis. So they depend on the same cognitive faculty. Okay? So if it's a visual, you know, an eye, uh, eye faculty, you're, you're going to have a form. You're going to have, or you're going to have, um, you know, a primary consciousness and the, its attendant uh, mental factors, and all of them are dependent, you know, on that cognitive faculty to arise, okay? Because without that cognitive faculty doing something, none of the consciousnesses and their mental factors are going to arise. What? Yeah. Although faculty is better because when we say sense power, we forget about the mind. Okay. Then the second is they, ha they share the same observed object. So what they are apprehending is the same thing. It's not that the primary consciousness apprehends one thing and each of the mental factors with it apprehends something else. Okay. So they all have depend on the same cognitive faculty, they all apprehend the same object, okay? Both are generated in the same aspect of the object, so they reflect a similar aspect of the object. So if you're meditating, I don't know, on impermanence or something, it might, you know, they're both focused like that on that aspect of the object. Then fourth, is they occur at the same time. Yeah, so they arise, abide, cease simultaneously. It's not that you first have a mental, uh, let's say, 
a visual consciousness, and then one by one, all the mental factors, you know, you get attention, intention, contact, feeling, discrimination, they all pop in and, and join the, uh, you know, on the plate at the same time. No, all these things arise together, they cease together. Okay? And they're the same entity or the same substance. So each mental state consists of only one primary consciousness and only one of each of its accompanying mental factors. Okay? So if you have a mental state, you can't have a mental state that's a combination of a visual consciousness and an auditory consciousness. And you, or you know, where there's two primary consciousnesses going on in one mental state. You can't have a mental state where there's one primary consciousness and then there's two mental factors of uh, feeling <laughs> or two mental factors of anger going on at, it, at the same time. Okay? So furthermore, the primary mind and all its accompanying mental factors are either conceptual or non-conceptual either mistaken or non-mistaken. So you can't have part of a mental state, and then by mental state I mean the primary mind plus its attentive, its attentive uh, attending, associated, concomitant, accompanying mental factors. Okay, so, um, you know, they're all, the, the primary mind, the mental factors, they're all either conceptual or not conceptual. They're either all uh, mistaken or all correct. Okay? So the Pali scripture, uh, the Melinda Pana, pa, Pana, Pata, Pana, which is a beautiful book, I really recommend it, yeah, contains an excellent example of the relationship of a primary consciousness and its accompanying mental factors. So this, the whole scripture is, it's in the Pali, but you can see in this scripture how the, some Mahayana ideas are coming through there. Okay. Okay. So King Melinda asked the monk Nagasena, Nagasena Tara, whether mental factors can be separated out such that we see them as different parts of the puzzle. This is contact, over here is feeling, this is mentation, meaning um, the miscellaneous, uh, I don't know, maybe it means the primary consciousness, you know, and this is discrimination. Nagas, so all these different mental factors and primary consciousnesses. Yeah, mentation must mean the primary consciousness. Yeah, look up mentation, somebody. It's as mental activity. Huh? Mental activity. Generally. Generally, okay. So it can mean anything we want it to mean. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm saying it means primary consciousness here. Okay. <laughs> or maybe it means. Uh, yeah, that's true. He was asking the the question, contact, feeling, discrimination. Maybe it means it's in in. We already have contact, attention or intention. Those are the other two. Okay. Anyway, mentation. Um, Nagasenda uh, Tara replied by asking if the king would be able to pick out each flavor separate from all the others when the royal cook makes a syrup or a sauce with curds, salt, ginger, cumin seed, pepper, and other ingredients. So when you make a, a, a sauce and you pick, put in many different spices, can you taste each spice separately from the other when they've all been boiled together for a long time? No. It forms one flavor, doesn't it? Okay, so this, uh, clearly this would not be possible. All the various flavors together give the sauce its taste. It's not that, you know, oh, 
there, I taste pepper. Then the next moment, oh, now I taste salt. Then, oh, now I taste cumin. Yeah, it's not like that. Okay. All the various flavors together give the sauce its taste, even though each ingredient adds its own unique flavor. So in a similar way, each mental factor does its own particular job. In the five, omnip- five ones, uh, they're called omnipresent. They accompany every mental state. You know, intention has its own job of, di- you know, directing the mind to something. Attention has its job, you know, fixating on it. Contact has the job of connecting the the consciousness and the object. Feeling has the job of experiencing it. Discrimination has the job of uh, discerning what the object is. So they all perform a different function, yeah, but you can't see them separately when the consciousness is going on. It's like, you know, each ingredient in the sauce adds something to it, but when you're tasting the sauce, you just get one whole taste. Similarly, the various mental factors accompanying a primary consciousness function together and cannot be separated out since they share the same basis, the same observed object, the same aspect, the same time, and the same entity. Nevertheless, the primary consciousness and each mental factor perform its unique function and contribute its own flavor to the cognizer. Okay. Now, another example, which I think is this, I like this example too. Okay, another example. This is actually, I learned this one from Jeffrey. Okay, and I don't know, he may have learned it from His Holiness. But um, the primary consciousness is like the main light in a room. While its accompanying mental factors are like other lights in the same room. While each light is distinct, they blend together to illuminate the room. The fact that an auditory primary consciousness is present means that all its accompanying mental factors also perceive sound. If the mental factor of feeling experiences pleasure, the entire mental state is pleasurable. Okay, so if we look in the room, we have how many lights here? Six of the big ones, two, four up there. Uh, okay, so ten, and then we have all these little ones, which I'm not going to count. Okay, <laughs> all these lights, you can see each one as a source of light differently. Can you see each one's light in the room? No, because all the light comes together, and the room has light in it. We can't differentiate which light is coming from which lamp. Can you? It isn't like, okay, from there there's a light ray right down there falling between the two of you, and that that space is lit up, but nothing else is. No, it, all the light merges together. So it's the same with the primary consciousness and whatever mental factors are with it. Okay. The mental factors described below are not an exhaustive list. Okay, Remember that. They are the principal ones that must be abandoned or cultivated in order to attain liberation. Their enumeration and precise definitions may differ according to the specific Abhidharma text. Here, the prominent mental factors are counted as 51 and divided into six groups in accordance with the compendium of knowledge. So they're divided into the five omnipresent mental factors, the five object ascertaining mental factors, the 11 virtuous mental factors, the six root afflictions, the 20 secondary afflictions, and the four variable mental factors. Okay. In the Pali system, they have different way, they sometimes have different numbers in these categories. Also, wait until you get to volume three and you read about all the different afflictions. And there's so many ways to categorize afflictions. Yeah, you have the 10 fetters, 
you have the six entanglements, you have the root afflictions, you have the auxiliary afflictions, you have the floods and the lo- the the floods and the yokes and the uh, contaminants, and there's so many different ways of classifying afflictions. Okay? Yeah? So this is one way. And again, again, it's not exhausted. It doesn't include all of them. Because like it said, the, the reason we're dividing or, or put, you know, uh, making these things appear special or different or noting them is because they're either very important uh, to abandon to attain awakening, uh, awakening or they're very important to cultivate to attain awakening. So the whole psychology presented in Buddhism, specifically in the Abhidharma, is done that way for the purpose of attaining liberation. Yeah? Okay. Okay, so here we go. We're going to look at the 51, except for some of them we won't look at specifically because they're in Volume 3, <laughs> which comes out in January. Aren't you excited? Yes? Remember, we have the, the six primary consciousnesses. Okay, so the five omnipresent ones accompany all minds, all consciousnesses. Okay, without them... Complete cognition of an object cannot occur. So it isn't, you know, like we may have a machine, and if one part breaks down, the whole machine breaks. It's not like this with the, with the mind and mental factors. Yeah? Uh, they, you can't have, how to say, yeah, they don't break down like that. If, if, if you overcome anger, let's say, and you obliterate anger, then the whole mental state of anger ceases. It's not that you can obliterate anger and then you still have the primary mind and and all those other ones, but you're just missing the anger part. Yeah, if you obliterate anger, that whole mental consciousness, you know, falls apart. The mind in the next moment may be a mind with other mental factors, but it won't have anger in it. But that's fine. It's a different mental factor. Okay? So don't have this image of like, you know, this machine and then one part breaks down uh, and then, yeah, okay? So here are the, the five omnipresent ones. So here, again, we're just introducing them. We're not getting into the details of of, uh, you know, how each one is classified and all the debates and stuff revolving it. We're giving you a a basic understanding. But it's really good because as you start to look for these in your experience, then you come to understand how your mind works. And since our mind is the main field, our mind is the source of samsara and nirvana, the more we understand the mind, then the more we can work with it. Okay, so feeling is the first one. So it is an experience of pleasure, pain, or neutrality. Feeling experiences the results of our past actions and can lead to reactions of attachment, anger, confusion, and so forth. And that's what I was saying a few minutes ago. You know, how... You know, we have a feeling, and then we just respond to that feeling, and it, that response carries us away. Yeah, it's quite interesting to watch. You know, do you watch how, you know, some little thing happens, and your mind reacts to it, and then your mind keeps reacting to it? And, you know, 15 minutes later, you're still mulling over that tiny little interchange or tiny little thing that happened. Have you noticed that? It's like, why am I still thinking about that? It was some small, tiny something. And yet, yeah, you know, 
Like somebody ate the last uh, spring roll. Yeah. Oh, I like spring rolls, but not oily ones. <laughs> I know that sounds like an oxymoron. <laughs> Aren't spring rolls supposed to be dripping with oil? Um, okay. So you really like spring rolls. There they are on the buffet table. Somebody ate the last spring roll. I didn't get the last spring roll. You know? Then, you know, I eat my salad. I eat my noodles. I eat, you know, everything else. But I'm still thinking, I didn't get a spring roll. And this isn't fair. The cook knows. And if you're a cook at the Abbey, you know that you have to create the right number so that everybody gets one. Because if anybody misses out, they are not a happy camper. You know? <laughs> And their renunciation has gone out the window. <laughs> and you will hear about it directly. It will be a direct auditory <laughs> experience of their voice letting you know that you did not make one, at least one of these things for every single person. Okay. Where was I? <laughs> so you're thinking about there's some little thing. You know, you didn't get your spring roll. And you're thinking about it the whole meal. Isn't that amazing? Have you ever stopped yourself in the middle and recognized what you've done? Usually we just go on thinking about it. We're not even aware that we're meditating on spring rolls. <laughs> You know, it's just automatic, you know, samadhi on spring rolls, <laughs> interrupted by salad and noodles. <laughs> but, you know, if you, every once in a while, if you stop and it's like, wow, I'm focused on those spring rolls. And that was for, from like five minutes ago or 10 minutes ago or 30 minutes ago or yesterday. <laughs> yeah? And like, why is my precious time and precious mental energy that is so limited in this life focused on spring rolls? You know? Do you ever stop and ask yourself that? Probably hardly ever. But once in a while, if you do, you know, it's really a wake-up call of like, Okay, I got to cut this, you know, because what my mind is dwelling on is not worth it. And you especially hear <laughs> about uh, people not getting the same food from the people who choose not to eat in the evening. They're the ones who complain that the fresh muffins are served in the evening, and they didn't get one. And the cheese. The, the cheese goes out. The, the tea? Cheese. Cheese. Oh. Oh, my God. The cheese goes out at night, and I've chosen by my own voluntary free will not to eat at night. But those people in the kitchen are so insensitive and discriminative and everything is unfair. And they won't even let me take a piece of cheese and put it in my bowl and keep it for the morning. <laughs> you know, I tried that and they caught me. <laughs> and I'm going to let them know they have to put the cheese out in the morning when I can get some. And I am renouncing all attachment to sense pleasure. <laughs> okay. You're amazed. Sometimes it's quite amazing what the discussions in a monastery center on. <laughs> you know, 
I mean, how much significance a piece of cheese can have. <laughs> yeah, or a spring roll. Yeah. Or, you know, oh, you know what really gets? The people who choose not to eat in the evening, they can have juice. But the people who eat in the evening is not drink that juice. So the people who don't eat in the evening complain that they can't get the juice, that only the people who don't eat in the evening can have it. Okay, But they're the people who are having a whole meal. But they're mad because they can't have the juice with their meal. And these ones are mad because they have the juice, but they can't have the piece of cheese that that one gets. <laughs> yeah? And so we need to have a community meeting. <laughs> yeah, because this is just getting out of hand. <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. We need to have an expert nonviolent communication come in and help us communicate about cheese and orange juice. Yeah. Because, you know, if I'm going to stay in this monastery, <laughs> my residence in this monastery depends on if I can get what I want, because otherwise I'm going to starve to death here. I am poorly <laughs> nourished. Yeah, I don't care there's people who, who just eat noodles. I don't care that there's people starving. I am malnourished if I don't get my orange juice and my piece of cheese. And if I don't eat dairy, then I want something else. Don't give me a piece of cheese and say you got what everybody else got. I don't eat dairy, so give me something else that I like. <laughs> May all sent <sentient> beings <laughs> happy and as possible. May all that you please be free of suffering as it causes, especially me. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> okay, that's the first omnipresent mental factor. <laughs> Feeling. Okay. Discrimination. Yeah, functions to distinguish. It is this and not that and to apprehend the characteristics of an object. It differentiates and identifies objects. So this is the one that's very important in distinguishing gluten-free from gluten. <laughs> yeah. And you're serving cake. Where did that cake come from? You know, how come there's only cake with gluten out and not gluten-free cake? Well, because we just accept what the donors offer. <laughs> that doesn't matter. You should educate them that when they bring gluten cake, they should also bring gluten-free cake. But we're renunciants, and we don't demand anything of the people who offer to us. <laughs> yeah, contentment. Yeah, I'll be content. I want my gluten-free stuff. <laughs> And I want it fresh. I don't want it stale. Yeah. And then you get a lot of gluten-free stuff. And the gluten people finish their stuff. <laughs> well, but they can't. They can't eat the gluten-free because the gluten-free people will get mad at them. So they're looking... You know, at that gluten-free stuff, there's sap. <laughs> yeah, while the gluten-free people just go and tell you, just take a little bit of it, you know, and leave it all the rest there. But the gluten people cannot eat it. <laughs> Don't you dare. Hey, intention. <laughs> Uh, 
Okay, intention moves the primary mind and its accompanying mental factors to the object. Okay, that person who works in the kitchen, who is unfair. Okay, intention moves the mind to that object. It is the conscious and automatic motivating element that causes the mind to involve itself with and apprehend its object. It is action or karma. Okay? So you're wondering what karma is. Yes, karma from the Prasangika viewpoint can also be physical and verbal. But everybody agrees that karma is this mental intention, this mental factor of intention. Okay? Now, of course, that the mental factor of intention cannot be virtuous or non-virtuous and neutral or without the presence of other mental factors. So if you have a mental uh, consciousness, all mental consciousnesses have this one of intention. Okay? If you have a mental consciousness, yeah, primary consciousness, you have intention there. If you also have the mental factor of anger, then the whole thing becomes non-virtuous. If you have your, you know, your, your, uh, your primary consciousness and your five on the present, plus the mental factor of uh, generosity, you know, then everything becomes virtuous like that, okay? Generosity is not one of the 51, but you can see it's kind of a mental factor. It's the, it, it would actually be called technically non-attachment. That's mental, that's generosity. Okay, so intention is the conscious and automatic motivating element that causes the mind to involve itself with and apprehend its object. It is action, karma. Although the mental factor of intention itself is not constructive, destructive, or neutral, virtuous, non-virtuous, or neutral. It becomes so depending on what other mental factors, such as attachment or anger, accompany that mental state. Okay. Then the fourth one, attention. So this is also called mental engagement. This, this one, Manasakara, comes in so many different forms, so many different places, and is, can be translated in so many different ways and has different meanings. So it's the same word, but it has different definitions according to where it comes. Okay? So attention functions to direct the primary consciousness and its concomitant mental factors to the object and to actually apprehend the object. It focuses and holds the mind on an object without allowing it to move elsewhere. So that's what that mental factor does. Then the mental factor of contact connects the object, the cognitive faculty, and the primary consciousness, thereby acting as a basis for feelings of pleasure, pain, and indifference. It is the cause of feeling. So the, men the mental factor of consciousness in one moment is the cause of the feeling in the next moment. The compendium of knowledge says that the five omnipresent mental factors accompanying all primary consciousnesses. The Abhidharma system of the Pali Canon explains that each primary consciousness has seven, not five, but seven omni omnipresent mental factors. Okay? Contact, feeling, discrimination, Okay, which poly translators often render as perception. Intention, or which they sometimes translate as volition. So those four are the same. Then they also add one pointedness and life faculty or psychic life. And then their seventh one is attention, which is in common with uh, our, our version of it. Okay. So those are the, the five omnipresent mental factors that accompany every uh, mental state, every primary mind. 
Okay. And then tomorrow we will continue to with the other ones. Okay, maybe tomorrow. Yeah, we'll go up to page 69 and then we'll save the rest for next year.